bloated, basil, blowhard bellows. Banks must bail in. And who's afraid of Albanese visiting Australia's biggest trading partner? Coming up on this week's episode of The Citizen's Report. Welcome to The Citizen's Report for the 26th of October 2023. I'm Robert Barwick and I'm joined today by Citizens Party researcher and writer Richard Barden. Welcome Richard. Thanks Robbie. In this week's episode, we are going to talk about bail-in because uh, a lot's happened lately, Richard, and it actually hasn't been on the front burner, but the Bank for International Settlements' biggest heavyweight, <laughs> shall we say, has given a speech making it clear it is on the agenda. And bail-in, of course, meaning the allowing the banks to steal your deposits um, to prop themselves up. Um, and we're going to get you to tell... Uh, the story of the latest example of the effort to really sabotage the trip that Anthony Albanese is supposed to be making to Beijing in a week or so. Um, so before we get into that, remember, it's very we, we're nothing without you guys, and that includes helping us get the message out through this show. Uh, so the way to do that is share it as widely as you can, like the show, and subscribe if you're not a subscriber. Click the bell icon. Um, please comment on the show below. That's a very important part of the process. Try and engage with those comments and also to help with our campaigns because everything we talk about we're actually campaigning on. Um, please consider making a donation to the donate button below. I also want to do something a little bit different than what we usually do. We may, we may do this regularly. A lot of what we cover in this show, as we've made clear in the past, is from our weekly magazine, the Australian Alert Service. And um, just to give you a sense of the contents of this alert service, because some of it is like Richard's going to be talking about an important article he wrote this week. We have an editorial at the front. This week's editorial is called Moment of Truth for Australia's Future. And we're going to cover that as well. It's a contrast between what happened at the Belt and Road Conference in terms of money for infrastructure and what's, what's happening at the US Congress, where it's all about the debate over money for war. Um, and, you know, what, which, which path does Australia want to take? Um, we have an article here, Truth Not War, support whistleblower David McBride at his unjust trial on the 12th and 13th of November. And that's about David McBride's trial is coming up on the 13th of November in Canberra. Um, so we give the details of the significance of that trial and we encourage people to get along to that. But on the 12th, there's a festival at Glebe Park in Canberra from one o'clock to five o'clock. And we really encourage people to get along and show their support. Because, you know, the people, the, the mere existence of people like David McBride shows that our moral superiority that we like to claim we have on the world stage, we don't have. It's mm -hmm. just not true. And he's just one of them, Julian Assange, of course, being another. Um, we have an article this week by Melissa Harrison, as Taiwan buying political influence in Australia, where we won't have time to continue our Morrison theme this week, but it is a continuation of the Morrison theme and about the money involved. We touched on some of this last week, but... Um, Morrison is hanging out with people who are being, being paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to spruik the Taiwan line that he's, he's spruiking. He doesn't have to declare, well, though, Richard, what he's being mm. paid. And so we're saying, well, how much is he being paid yep. for this? So much for transparency. So much for transparency. Five Eyes revives IP theft furphy ahead of Albanese's China trip. We'll talk about that, but that's in this week's alert. Um, we have a... We have a, a uh, a feature in the middle called the Australian Almanac, and this one is the transcript of an interview with um, ambas American Ambassador Chaz Freeman. Five centuries of Euro-Atlantic hegemony have come to an end. Um, and then we give some more updates on the Belt and Road. The curse of QE continues, which is quantitative easing. Um, our Washington Insider column strategic commission report revives Dr. Strangelove. Um, and then we have a feature on our organising around the, the country with a lot of fantastic photos this time of the different campaigning efforts that our people have got up to. That's what's in our Australian Alert Service. That's the sample of it. That's this week's. Um, one way you can su support us um, by donating is actually by subscribing to that. This is available by subscription. This is how the Citizens Party funds itself. And all we can't do justice on this show to the depth of material that's in the Alert Service. But we try 
and we're going to try straight away and get into that. Um, and then just quickly before we begin, again, reminder, there's two things we're, we're asking people to do by a deadline. One is, we'll put the link again below, but there's, there's a parliamentary e-petition calling for the cancellation of the forced posture agreement, which is the agreement signed in 2014, which basically hands over all our territory where the US has bases to US control, and that's expanding. Um, so that there's a 40 day window to sign that. And if you haven't signed it, please sign it. The details will be below. Um, and then there's one week or so left to make a submission to the, to the um, Treasury exposure draft bill on uh, regulating digital payments. And what we're asking people to do in that, a submission in this case is just an email, the details will be below. But we're just asking people, look, here's an opportunity. Don't worry about what the, don't worry about the digital part of this. You know, we don't have any real crimes with the bill per, sway, per se, sorry. But tell the Treasury, don't, whatever you do with digital payments, do not ban cash. You must protect cash at all costs. And it's like a shot across the bow kind of idea. So if you haven't sent that email yet, the details below and you can do that. All right, Richard, let's get into it. Bloated, basil, blowhard, bellows, banks must bail in. And I don't like being unfair, but we'll put a picture of this guy on the screen. <laughs> and it is a bit unfair, except he is from the Bank for International, that's Augustin Carstens. Mm. And he is from the Bank for International Settlements in Basel, in Switzerland. And it's what he's saying that made me a bit mean to call him a bloated blowhard. Mm. Because, sorry, what he's saying is, is um, you know, we, we can, let's steal the money of the poor to prop up yeah. the wealth He's, of the rich in the banks. He really is just a living 1930s cartoon. He is. He? Like, he is. I mean, we'd be calling him a bloated blowhard if he was as thin as a rake, but, you know. <laughs> he, just, he, he just happens he to just not happens be as thin as a rake. He just happens to look the part as well as act it. There is the, the, um, the officials at the Bank for International Settlements in Basel have this special diplomatic status like UN officials at the UN in, in mm. New York City. Right, and you know, diplomatic status that's conferred on on actual diplomats is you know you're you're not you can't be arrested in the country yeah. that Immun you serve immunity you know, from prosecution immunity from prosecution for just about everything. So that makes sense at the UN because you're not going to have all the countries of the world ever get together if they can't do that. Remember how Gaddafi once mm. just before he died, not long, not a few years before he died, he famously flew into New York City, went to the United Nations General Assembly. The Americans would have loved to have killed him then, mm. but of course they couldn't, right? Because it's diplomatic immunity means something and it's got a very long history. But for some reason, Richard, that also applies to the Bank for International Settlements, mm. even though it's not even you know, I don't even know what its official status is in law, um, except that it is the club that the central banks all belong mm. to. Well, I think they had to set that up because a lot of its board in the early days were actual Nazis. They were. And, and there was so a big debate after World War II, should we shut this down because of how much it helped the Nazis? Mm. And it was rescued by the Brits, actually. They made sure it didn't get shut down. So um, that, that status includes... That guy, Augustin Carstens, he doesn't pay tax in Switzerland. And it looks like he's eating his profits. <laughs> anyway, let's, why are we being mean to him? Well, let's, let's have a look. Um, what's the context of this? Today is the 26th of October. So we have Senate estimates going on in Parliament in Australia this week. And the Reserve Bank is there right now. In fact, I was watching Michelle Bullock, the new governor of the Reserve Bank, just before we came in to record the show. This is Thursday morning. So I'm not, I haven't heard what she's saying yet. I'm, I've, got, I've, I've suggested some questions to some senators that I hope, that, that I hope they ask her. Um, so we'll see if that happens and if so, we'll play them next week. Uh, but Reser Michelle Bullock has to decide whether she's going to raise interest rates again in, on Melbourne Cup Day, right? The first Tuesday in November. Um, and of course, if she does... What's that, you know, in the name of fighting inflation, it's going to drive up the actual cost of living mm. for the most vulnerable Australians, right? Whether you have a mortgage or are renting off someone who has a mortgage, you are going to be smashed by that. But that's what they do. They call it, we're fighting inflation by driving up the cost of living. Um, now, this though, Richard, has taken the world, this is part of, you know, we said years ago that, the, that with the way they were handling the, the debt crisis following the 2008 crash, it, by printing money, 
Hmm. There was going to be one disaster or another. It was a catch-22. There's either going to be an actual crash or there's going to be hyperinflation, right? Which, which is still effectively a disaster, right? Hmm. It's, it's the same type of catastrophe, just maybe a slower burn or whatever. But nevertheless, that's what they were setting up. And now we're at that point where that's the balancing act. You know, what, what do we do? Because these central banks only have one trick, which is um, raising and lowering interest rates. That's all they seem to know um, what to do. Basel, the Bank for International Settlements, is the central bank of central banks. And when Michelle Bullock makes this decision on Melbourne Cup Day about interest rates, she will, they will discuss it at a board level at the Reserve Bank, but there will also have been communications with the Bank for International Settlements about that decision. Mm. This is coordinated, this stuff. Yeah. Communications, by the way, which they keep secret from the Australian That's Parliament, right. let alone the Australian <laughs> public. That's right. That's right. So um, now, if when the banks are making these decisions, Richard, they, the, the number one constituency these central banks have in mind is the private banks, right? Because it's while they have these legislated requirements about inflation, etc., they are there to make sure the banking system functions at least the way the banking system wants to function, right? So, they, they, so they'll be they'll be quite concerned about the private banks, and so there's so much debt in the world. The question is. I mean, we got a briefing the other day that the debt in the last 10 years has gone from like um, $200 uh, trillion to $300 trillion, right? Mm. And now, now that interest rates are rising, this sort of stuff's unpayable. And the question is, what, are, what, what happens to these banks if these interest rates and the consequence of these interest rates starts to affect their bottom line? People, initially, the banks make a big profit out of interest rates, mm. but... The, the, the assets the banks hold are what lose their value with these interest rate crashes, right? So what happens in those circumstances? Well, back in 2011, the Bank for International Settlements um, Financial Stability Board, they call it, came up with a plan called bail-in. And bail-in is the idea that... Um, well, it's not a bailout. Bailout is what you do with taxpayer money. So just elaborate on what bail-in does. Yeah, so instead of creating money, what they call printing money, although it's mostly digital now, yep. and handing that to the banks by buying crap off them, um, which is what our RBA has been doing and just about everyone yep. else, they freeze the system, freeze the banks. <coughs> uh, the, the best example that people probably remember is... Um, uh, just over 10 years ago in Cyprus, when their bank's uh, bets on Greek debt went bad. Yep. There was nothing wrong per se with the Cypriot economy. It was their banks got in trouble gambling on yep. rubbish. And so they froze the system. They wrote down the asset values or the, you know, to their market value. And then they just wrote down everything else and confiscated deposits and, and uh, wiped out uh, everybody uh, that they had to, to bring the, the liabilities down and they convert the deposits into shares in the bank to recapitalise it. So congratulations, you're now the part owner of a, of a defunct... Of a useless bank. Of a useless <laughs> bank. And you, and, oh, but you, can't sh you can't sell the shares. No, that's right? right. So this is the plan they came up with where they force the burden onto households. Well, 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 hang on, you said the plan. Remember how shocked everyone was that Cyprus happened? And then we did discover, yeah, yeah that hang was on, the this plan. was the plan. Yeah, a couple of years it's, earlier. It's and this guy, this. Paul Tucker, from the Bank of England and later BIS, or concurrently for a while, and then, but anyway, um, was on the, you know, at a conference saying, well, it's, it's households. Of course it's households. What, he wanted to come back onto the banking system? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, Paul, that'd actually, you know, we, that, that'd yeah. be nice. Households have to bear the burden. <laughs> Now, in 2017, our party caught wind that there was a bill before the Australian Parliament that had all the language, such as resolution regimes, that we knew was, were hallmarks of bail-in. And we looked at that bill and we identified there was a, 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 like a back door, a loophole mm. in that legislation that in an emergency could be used to bail in Australian deposits. We had the government say, no, 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 we would never bail in deposits. Mm. But the same government had already committed to this plan. They go to these Bank for International Settlements and Financial Stability Board events and they had signed on to this plan. So we knew you couldn't trust them when they said they wouldn't do it, mm. right? 
and we identified this bill and of course it infamously passed on Valentine's Day 2018 um, through the Australian Senate with only eight senators present and that you know that that we've had that that's now in law it hasn't been tested yet mm. but Richard something interesting has happened in the meantime outside of Cyprus in tw March 2023 there have been multiple bail-ins in Europe mm. especially in Italy and Spain with smaller banks yeah individual banks individuals and they've all been very disruptive and made the governments of those countries mm. incredibly nervous and in fact the Italians got to the point where they refused to do it, mm. right? The EU said you must bail in and the Italians got to the point saying, we're not gonna bail in like you want us to bail in. We're mm. gonna even break your bloody look because the consequences, you're destroying confidence in the banking system by taking away people's deposits. That relationship between your savings and your bank is a trust relationship. Mm. And if you destroy that, you don't have a banking system. Yep. Smart I mean, people pointed that out. Yep. I mean, I'm sure we all saw Mary Poppins growing up. Yeah, that's right. Everyone remember what a bank run is? Go back and watch that if you've forgotten. That's right. Mr. And they were, that guy was Mr. Banks. Mm. Um, now, so this year we've had a couple of financial crises, one in the United States and one in Switzerland. And that's the reason that we're covering this issue because in both of those financial crises, bail-in was not used. Both jurisdictions propped up their failing banks in other ways other than using this model of bail-in that they had mm. signed on to, right? And so on the 19th of October, Augustin Carstens from the Bank for International Settlements stepped in at a high-level meeting on banking supervision in Panama City, Panama. Good place for bankers to go and congregate. Um, that you go to... You know he doesn't he doesn't have to pay tax in Switzerland. Mm. He probably gets a tax tax back in Panama <laughs> <laughs> that he hasn't paid. Anyway, um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, he on, so this is what he did in this speech. He on the one hand he praised the novel approaches of central bankers to dealing with the collapse of the U.S. banks and Credit Suisse in Switzerland in March. But then he insisted that all jurisdictions signatory to the BIS resolution regimes, i.e. bail-in, the confiscation of deposits um, and other uh, liabilities of the bank, um, must upgrade their regulatory frameworks to allow full bail-in procedures to be followed, he said. And his speech was called, Some Lessons for Crisis Management from Recent Bank Failures. And he called what the Federal Reserve had done and the Swiss National Bank had done their performance had been mixed. This is what he said in Switzerland, quote, the authorities opted to impose losses on some creditors without using the resolution framework, Carstens noticed, noted. Swiss authorities merged Credit Suisse with UBS using emergency powers, describing the merger, merger as a commercial transaction. They judged this path as being less, quote, less disruptive to financial stability, said Carstens. They, quote, decided not to use statutory resolution powers to execute the resolution plan. However, losses were imposed on creditors who held bail inable bonds. This proved, said Carstens, contrary to the fears of some observers, that a write down of globally systemically important bank debt instruments and globally systemically important bank, which of course means too big to fail banks. Mm. There's about 30 of them identified around the world as too big to fail, i.e. they must be propped up at all costs. Um, he said, this proves that the right down of their debt instruments is feasible without destabilizing markets in any deep or persistent way. And he was responding to long voiced claims that confiscation of private instruments in banks where the bonds or deposits, i.e. not only shares, would cause greater destabilization to the banking system. Um, and then he had a crack at what the Americans had done, done to save um, Silicon Valley Bank and, and um, uh, the couple of other big banks in the United States that went under. He said that while the overall story is positive because systemic disruption was avoided, the authorities had to resort to emergency powers or exceptional actions. Therefore, he ruled, crisis management frameworks must be improved to sweep up everything. His disapproval of the actions of sovereign governments using their discretion rather than following the plan highlights the true intention of Bank for International Settlement Crisis Management, gaining control over the policies of nations across the globe. 
And that's why we call them the banker's dictatorship, mm. right? That's what they've been gunning for all along. Yeah. And remember, they've been, and we've been reporting on this all along, they're quite open about it. Like that, what's his name? Mark Carney, the yeah, former yeah. head of the Bank of England, Canadian, he ran the Bank of Canada and then they brought him to England. Who chaired the Financial Stability Board as well. Yeah. Um, and now he's pushing all this green finance garbage because <laughs> that's where the next big banker's mm. bonanza is. Um, you know, the world's ending if we don't trade carbon. But anyway, um, and he was, he called for a financial regime change. Yes. If, you know, with, and he's working with the likes of BlackRock and, the, and Vanguard, these big American hedge funds and these other investment banks, so-called, that are yep. basically glorified hedge funds nowadays. And they want control of monetary policy taken away from governments. They do. And they're and quite open about it. And so what this shows you is that the architects of bail-in still fully intend to use bail-in. Yeah. And, and that is a pressure that's going to be on our governments in an emergency because in Australia right now, um, uh, there is actually a real crisis in the banking system. It's just that we have a system where the banks get to privatise their profits and socialise their losses. And so we'll put this on the screen and this is going to, I'm sure this is going to come up with the Reserve Bank Governor Michelle Bullock today. Look at this graph and the red there, and the, you'll see the headline anyway, RBA's $43 billion in losses put pressure on Chalmers for bailout. But it's not the RBA, it's not really the RBA's losses. Mm. They, it's what they bought off the banks yeah. in order to prop the banks up in COVID that's what's making the losses. So our banks, what's the headlines for our banks? They're, they're getting mass record profits at the moment. Mm, year the RB, after year after year. Exactly. The RB, the, but there's this deep losses in terms of collapse in value of assets, banking assets in the banking system. They're being held by the mm. Reserve Bank of Australia. Yeah, which they knew were going to collapse. And that's why yeah. that. So this is just straight up transferring losses from the private banks to the one public bank. That's right. The one and only. That's right. Um, and so now it's our problem, apparently. And so here's the, the, the conclusion of all this. The solution to all these problems, you know, whether it's the threat of bail-in or, or um, the, 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 the banks being able to just, uh, you know, give us, uh, offload all their problems onto the, pub, onto the taxpayer, etc., is what the Citizens Party has made a name for itself advocating for 30 years. We have to bring back a national bank. The, the RBA is our public bank. We need to turn it into a full-blown national bank. If it can carry that for the banks, for the private banks, for only the benefit of their profitability, it, on behalf of the government, can carry the whole economy mm. for the benefit of investing in the things that the private sector will never do because they're not profitable enough Mm -hmm. But they become the essence of economic progress going forward because it's 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 infrastructure and and those kind of long term investments, right? Mm -hmm. That's what a national bank could do, should do. That's what it should do with a retail side that we could have operating through all the post offices in Australia. Because if the private banks want to say it's too it's too unprofitable, and we know it's not the real issue, but if they want to, if 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 they see post off, if they see branches as a lag on their profitability, right, and don't want to do it anymore. Well, let the public have, the, have a banking system, a public bank operating through the post offices and still provide that service. And the profitability of that bank will be enormous. And then the private banks will change their mind and want to be part of that. But the other thing that will happen will just benefit. There is, a, there is a better way to benefit the private banks than this, Richard, is if a public bank actually does invest in infrastructure and in industry in the real economy, the economic pie in Australia will grow in an e much more even way across the whole country. And mm. that'll create truly commercial profit opportunities for the, public, for the private banks anyway. Yeah. And this is not speculation, haha, on no. our part. <laughs> no. This, we've done this all before. This is what the Commonwealth Bank did 100 years ago. It's how we built ourselves. It's, 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 it used to be basic economics. Yeah. Nobody teaches economics that way anymore, unfortunately. All right. So... Be, be warned, be aware that bail-in is still a very real agenda being pushed by the Bank for International Settlements and we in the Citizens Party are the watchers on the wall on this one. There is a bill that One Nation Senator Malcolm Roberts put up in 2020 to amend that bail-in law that passed in 2018. That didn't um, pass that bill in 2020, but it's there to be moved at any time. 
right? So we are on guard waiting for any, ch any possibility that, that this would be necessary and someone like Senator Roberts would be happy to move that again. Um, all right, but let's leave it there, move on, Richard, in the time we've got left. Who's afraid of Albanese visiting Australia's biggest trading partner? Because we've been talking about this for a few weeks now. People are, certain people are very afraid of this, <laughs> right? They're, they're doing their best to stop it. But, but look at the, um, I referred to this when I went through the alert service, we put it on the front page. Look at the, look at the, um, uh, the choice Australia has at the moment in, in strategic and economic terms. Um, the US Congress is currently debating a bill to, to, to put $100 billion into war. Ukraine, Israel, and essentially Taiwan. Mm. And I think there's a $3 billion earmark for something to do with the submarines that Australia is supposed to buy, right, mm. in that bill as well. That's what America's priority is. As well as the authorizations to, exp they've, they've lumped it in all together. Yeah. Authorizations to sell them in the first place. Exactly. So, and, that's, and Albanese's over there helping to lobby for that bill to pass, mm. right? This war bill, big spending. A week ago, the Chinese government announced an extra $100 billion to fund the Belt and Road Initiative from to two of their biggest banks and some other, and some other initiatives. $100 billion for infrastructure that's gonna help people uplift living standards versus $100 billion for war um, machines that's gonna kill people, right? And, you know, Australians, we need to think this through. What, what sort of future do we wanna be part of? And for some reason, we've been made to be terrified of the, one, of the side that's pushing peace and think all our security comes from the side that's pushing war. Um, and just as it happens, Albanese is visiting both. And that's really symbolic for the future of Australia, which he's visiting both, um, or that he's scheduled to visit both. He's at Washington now. Mm. Which direction is Australia going to take? Um, so in Washington, you know, Chuck, you, you can elaborate on some of this. Richard, you probably know better than me. But, you know, what he, the discussions he's been having in Washington, apart from lobbying for this bill to pass, is he's been basically trying to advance the agenda of this um, resources deal yeah, yeah. That, with the, that gives <laughs> yeah. Americans a lot more control over our resources. Yeah, so it's pretty much the, it's, it's much broader, but it's the economic equivalent of that force posture agreement that you mentioned earlier, where we're just handing control over to them. Yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, well, we for one of a public bank, a national bank that you were just talking about, oh, well, we can't afford to develop any of this stuff ourselves here in America, you have it, yeah. and, and feed us some crumbs if you feel like it, which, come on, American corporations, this is the origin of the term banana republic, right? Yeah, yeah. They take over whole countries if you let them. Yeah. And so that's what he's signing us up for. They've got, and it's all about China. It's all about beating China. You know, has a meeting with the US Commerce Secretary yesterday, Gina Raimondo. Critical minerals, we're going we're gonna to hand over, you know, the, the, the next big economic boon that we could make a squillion out of and, and you know, yeah. do anything we wanted to just by investing a little bit of money up front in some refining and processing and manufacturing here, like we did with aluminium 50 years ago. Nah, hand it all to the Americans that so you do it. And on and on and on. Battery minerals, lithium, uh, critical minerals for going into defense equipment. Um, and it's, I mean, um, uh, there's a lecturer from uh, RMIT here had a column in Pearls and Irritations, John Menadue's um, publication online today said, yeah, Albanese is now the chief lobbyist for the U.S. military industrial complex. And unfortunately, that's, that's what it's got down to. Um, while he's been having these discussions, they're pretty open in Washington. It is all about China. Yeah. Biden's talked repeatedly about China with Albanese. Um, the media keep asking, talking about China. The, the, the spokesman for the U.S. State Department, when asked about the visit, made it all about China. This is all about China. And I've had people predict to me that there's a chance Albanese, when he leaves Washington to come back to Australia before he goes to China next week, um, he will have been pressured mm. to cancel this trip to China. And Richard, that would fit because we've seen lots of signs of that in the last few weeks, right, mm. of the pressure on Albanese. So we didn't even, here's the, I brought this along because this was the weekend at Fin Review last week, um, 21, 22 October. Ten years on, Jury's still out on Xi's project, and there's, but there's a really good map there of the Belt and Road Initiative mm. project. And there's a really good line from New Zealand to China, right? Yep. But nothing from Australia. Australia, th this massive event last week in, in Beijing, Australia didn't attend. We didn't have an official representation mm. there, even though we make more money out of China than any other country yep. in the world. 
thanks to that Belt and Road Initiative, our resource sector is raking it in, yeah. right? But we don't even attend the conference. Or tax them properly for the profits they're making, <laughs> that's but that's a, diff that's a <laughs> somewhat side note. But. Um, so the other signs of, of, of uh, actually not wanting Albanese to go was what we've talked about for a few weeks now with Morrison actually former Prime Minister Scott Morrison making his business to try and sabotage the visit by going to Taiwan and, mm. and um, basically you know, marking territory there, stirring that up. Um, there was this ridiculous scare that Albanese's plane may be hacked if he went to Beijing. And anyway, so oh, the, the, people, the security people who warned the plane may be hacked said that he should postpone the visit. Um, but now... So we're, we're already on guard on that, and then this happened. And we'll put up the picture. This is what I wanted. This is what Richard's here to tell the story about. <laughs> These five guys got together in Palo Alto, California, and they are the five eyes, or the, the domestic security chiefs of the five eyes countries. And what was, you, people probably heard this on the news, but the big issue was, They'd never done this before, right, Richard? Mm. These, the Five Eyes Chiefs have never got together in public to make an announcement before. So why now? Why, what's so important that they're going to do this now? Mm. Well, the only thing happening is Albo and is, is about to go to China. And what did they do? What did they say? Well, it's rehashing. It's, it's old, old wine and new bottles in a sense because they've been going on about this for years and years about how China supposedly steals intellectual property. You know, every, everything that China does, all its advances, is all because they stole our precious, you know, <laughs> they stole it from us, you know. Yeah, um, now, now, Mike Burgess, the head of ASIO, has a certain look. So we did, did, we did run a, 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 we're a bit, a bit unfair this week. We did, <laughs> we did run this, this image of Mike Burgess and Gollum from Lord of the yeah. Rings complaining that they stole our precious. The false, the little false. <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> yeah, that, this is, they're seriously contending that China's economic advance and all of the technologies that it's developing and, and spreading through its economy and through the world's economy through the Belt and Road Initiative is because they stole them from us. Stuff we don't, including stuff we don't even have yet. I guess they stole a time machine too. But, um, but, and, but isn't it right, the Burgess's main examples of Australian innovation were all these really old ones? Oh, they're mostly, yeah. I mean, he claimed a couple of things that were actually invented independently in different places, including Wi-Fi and refrigerators. <laughs> refrigerators was long enough ago anyway, 150 yeah. years ago. But, um, <coughs> but yeah, all the actual examples of Australian inventions he could cite, um, apart from Google Maps, which was originally developed by a, by a company based in Sydney, right. although the founders of it were Danish. Um, at least two of the three of them. But uh, yeah, so it was all old things. It was penicillin that was developed uh, by Howard Florey. Yeah. It was, uh, what was the other one? The Hills Electric Hoist. drills. <laughs> he didn't mention the Hills Hoist. He should have. But here's the thing. So he cited examples of all innovation, these... but he, he wasn't saying China's stealing these. No. Right? But this is, oh, Australia's this wonderfully innovative country and China's stealing our intellectual property. Yeah, but and... he couldn't give examples of it. No. Couldn't give examples of the kind of uh, systematic hacking of this and that and the other and that he's talking about either. Because he says, oh, well, you know, everyone spies. That is, we spy on mm. China and mm. everyone else because we can. And so does everyone else. Um, but then he just cites, uh, you know, he says, oh, this goes well beyond traditional espionage. And then he only cites an example of traditional espionage where they, you know, supposedly Chinese intelligence recruited this academic and got him to put feelers out to get information that he, you know, for them and rah, 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 and they got onto it and chucked him out. Well, okay, maybe, you know, again, everyone spies. But they're all going on about how, oh, they hack everyone and they steal our IP, our, our inventions, our technologies, our innovations from, from every advanced Western economy. Um, you know, most especially the United States, supposedly, because this was convened by the head of the FBI, Christopher yep. Wray, yep. Um, in Silicon Valley. That's where Palo Alto is. It's that general San Francisco Bay Area with all the technology companies. Um, and Stanford University was where they held the thing. And, uh, and it's all garbage. And you, you also made the point that 150 years ago, the British were accusing America of this. Well, they, and they were doing it they're openly doing it. and That's unapologetically. Right. They were, you know, all of the, like, s steam engines and, and um, 
modern uh, metal smelting and, and foundries and so on. And, you know, British, I mean, the British Empire was the biggest empire in the world. Of course, they were going to be the leading yeah, yeah. technological innovator. And the Americans were getting out from under their yoke. And so they just pinched everything they could. Yeah. And then they invented, and then they led the world so for, a, for several decades, uh, century we can't, after that. And I think it's a good point because we can't state, you know, that, that no one in China has ever ripped off some well, Western technology. However, what you, you, you would have to be deliberately blinded by prejudice hmm. to look at China today and say this is an economy that only functions by stealing other people's technology yeah. because this is an economy that's had... Um, all sorts of sanctions put on it in, in the most high tech areas, and they have those sanctions have forced it to innovate on an unprecedented scale, and yeah. they've done very well. And you've got some pretty impressive stats that show you what China's doing anyway. Yeah, so this is just some examples of the, there's a, a UN agency, um, multilateral, you know, governmental, intergovernmental agency called the World Intellectual Property Organization, and it puts out annually the uh, Global Innovation Index Report. And these here are the country summaries from, of China and the USA. And now they seem to have invented a lot of these. They've actually added, I didn't go into it in the article, but they've added new, new things to go into these indices that look suspiciously as though they were invented to make the Western economies look better than they oh. would have otherwise, <laughs> that haven't been in, in previous years' yep. indices. But that aside, you know, like unicorn company valuations and it's like market cap, who cares? What do yeah, they make, yeah. right? Everything that goes into actually making, inventing, commercializing, manufacturing and distributing new technologies, China is streets ahead. And they say this is their own intellectual property. This is not stuff that they've, you know, it's not knockoffs. It's not, yep. you know, all the stereotypes. Let me go through a few figures here just to give you an idea. Patents by origin per billion US dollars equivalent in GDP. Now, this is adjusted for purchasing power parity to levelize the exchange rates, basically, that are so largely the, arbitrary. So, so the comparison numbers are uniform. You can, yeah, yeah. They're real, they're real comparisons. So patents by origin of, from that country by a billion, dollars, billion US dollars equivalent purchasing power parity adjusted. Uh, China. Uh, 52.4 per billion, number two in the world. The United States, 11.4, number seven in the world. Uh, scientific and technical articles uh, by the same metric, uh, 21.9 per billion, ranked 32 in the world for China. 14.1, uh, ranked 52 in the world uh, for the USA. And then... Uh, Labor productivity growth, 6.0% for the year, number one, China. America, 1.4%, number 50. Uh, trademarks, this is creative output. Trademarks, uh, China, per billion US dollars equivalent, 337.9, number one in the world. America, 24, oh. number 86. Uh, industrial designs. 28.9 in China, number two in the world. America, one, number 69 in the world. Creative goods export, exports to China, 11.3% of total trade, number one in the world. The United States, 2.7%, number 20 in the world. And, you know, so there's a whole bunch of other stuff there, some of which is relevant, some of which is not. A lot of it's skewed towards assumptions that the West that post-industrial economies are inherently more advanced. Um, but the upshot of it is all of these things that pertain, most of the things that pertain to real economies, mm. actual physical economy that we always talk about, unsurprisingly, because they in, this is what China invests $100 billion in, yep. right? They invest in this, not in wars. Not in, not in wars, not in trying to take over the world, not in co-opting other countries' resources. And, and despite Richard, there's, what you also, might have heard. there's also a cultural reflection because I'll, I'll, I'll never forget this poll that Lego, the kids' toy manufacturer, did. Lego. And I think it was, might have been 2018, something like that. And they, they polled the children in China, in America, and in the UK what do you want to be when you grow up? Mm -hmm. And the number one answer in China 
was astronaut, the number one answer in the United States was YouTuber. This thing called a YouTuber. Some mm. kid who, because, you know, YouTube, owned by Google in Silicon Valley, that's their idea of technology. That's their idea of, mm. you know, that we're, we're, we're expanding the, the, the human consciousness or something, yeah. right? Whereas China, you know, they got locked out of the International Space Station, and so they went and started their own. Yeah, built their right? own. They landed, they've done something no one else has done, which is land on the dark side of the moon, which mm. was an incredible engineering feat. And when China got to the stage of being able to do that, people should have actually seen through this stealing our intellectual property stuff and realized, hang on, we're being left behind the dust here. But like you said, when you see this kind of stunt where the Five Eyes guys get together just before Albanese's trip to make this claim, which you could, which you could identify was old wine in new bottles, right? Then this is not about intellectual property. This is about trying to sabotage this possibility that Australia might actually continue to improve its relationship with China, right? And then let's end on, some, on a slightly different note, but it's worth ending on because it goes to the heart of disinformation in the China realm as well. But it also goes back to this question of what sort of future does Australia want to be part of, right? And because there is, you know, the $100 billion the Americans are debating passing, there's a chunk of that is for Ukraine, a chunk of that is for Israel, a chunk of it is for mm. you know the Indo-Pacific, i.e. Taiwan, um, and, and a bit for Australia and the submarines, etc. And the urgency now is about Israel, right? The Israel-Gaza thing, and it's a hor horrific issue that's that's um, uh, flared up there. And but what you're seeing is this, is the same dividing lines around in the world around Israel-Gaza are the same that have been starting to form around Ukraine, Russia, around um, uh, well, the Belt and Road and all the countries that are working with China, mm. etc. This, 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 this sort of uh, uh, th these sort of dividing lines. Um, so we have a, a friend of this, sh a friend of well, a friend of mine uh, and uh, and yours, Richard. We've I've been on his show. Daniel Dumbrell is a Canadian who lives in China, and Daniel's a very intelligent guy. He made this video to just provide a contrast to the way. Our countries, and he's a Canadian, we're Australians, we're all part of the Five Eyes, the way our countries differentiate between what they accuse China of doing and what they're now happily overlooking in Or, or even Israel. defending actively. Defending, and maybe, maybe worse than defending, our government's announced we're sending military personnel over there now, right? Mm. Are, we mm. even gonna, are we actually going to participate in it in some way? That, that remains to be seen. Um, this is serious. Like we, you know, when it comes to this this country, uh, in Israel and what it's doing with the Palestinians, and that's not to say there wasn't a horrific terrorist attack, but that but that terrorist attack on the seventh of October was not the beginning of all these problems. No. Right. The, these problems go back decades. But the way the, the the reaction to it is if is if that was the beginning of all these problems, and it's not. But what we have had is quite a few years now of the world being told that genocide, literal genocide, is being committed by the Chinese in Xinjiang against the Uyghur Muslims. And I've had people, I've heard people in the West say this is the worst genocide since the Holocaust, which is mm. the event that gives the that the Israeli government claims gives them its moral their moral authority to do what they do, right? Um, so let's listen to our friend Daniel Dumbrell. This is a 10-minute clip. Please watch it. Uh, did actually give you the, the contrasting um, in the way this, this is being treated. The terrible images we see coming out of Palestine of dead, dying, injured children, grieving families, hysterical mothers, destroyed homes, and so much more, is exactly what the Western governments and propagandists wanted you to believe was happening to Muslims in China. This is the type of thing they wanted you to care about without providing any images of these things happening. Now, we see these things actually happening. We can see the images, we can see the videos. There's no question, there's no doubt about the suffering of Muslims and, and Palestinians of all other faiths and what they're facing now. But an odd thing has happened. The same people, the same governments, the same propagandists that wanted you to care about these types of things now stand with the people delivering that suffering.
the U.S. government, the main government funding and pushing this narrative that Muslims are being genocided in China, vetoed a U.N. Security Council resolution calling for a humanitarian pause to the killing and the violence responsible for thousands of Muslim deaths in Gaza thus far. Ursula, the president of the European Commission, who once said the idea that Russia was cutting men, women, and children off from water and electricity were acts of pure terror and considered them war crimes. When Israel did this same thing to their civilian population in Gaza, Ursula had little more to say other than that she stands with Israel and that Europe are friends of Israel. And leaders across the entire Western world began saying that Israel has the right to respond, a right to defend itself. China received no such empathy or support when they too experienced brutal terrorist attacks. Attacks which, by the way, targeted everyone, Uyghurs included. When China opened up their de-radicalization centers to Western media like the BBC and showed everyone one of the ways that they responded to extremism, it was labeled as dystopian and oppressive. Even just the idea that innocent people may also have been caught up in the training centers shown by BBC was considered crimes against humanity. Yet when Israel wipes out entire families of innocent people in their campaign to target terrorism, suddenly it's an acceptable and understandable level of collateral damage. And while Israel is in the process of turning what's frequently referred to as an open-air prison into a graveyard filled with its Muslim-majority inhabitants, they had the nerve to issue a joint statement in the form of a UN resolution raising concerns over how Muslims in China might be treated. So many of the other commentators on the so-called Uyghur genocide suddenly want to tweak their definition of genocide to give everyone a little bit more breathing room. Not so coincidentally, only after Palestinian children were being wiped out by the hundreds. J. Michelson wanted to continually remind everyone that Uyghurs were being genocided, but now faced with images of hundreds of dead Palestinian children, he wants to now instead spend his time explaining why Israel shouldn't be accused of genocide and how it's super important that we're really careful with throwing around such a loaded phrase like genocide. Jeffrey Kane, a propagandist and commentator on the, also on the so-called Uyghur genocide, once criticized TikTok for removing any content that came from Uyghur commentators under any circumstances and said that it meant that TikTok saw Uyghurs as terrorists. Now, after he saw that some Uyghurs stood with Hamas or with Palestinians, he expressed great disappointment. Does this now mean, according to his logic, that he himself suddenly believes there's a terrorist or terrorism sympathizer problem within the Uyghur community? I doubt he'll go that far. He won't say this directly, but certainly he went further than TikTok with his solution to this problem, and it didn't involve just trying to get their content taken down. Instead, Jeffrey began calling the FBI on Uyghur immigrants who sympathized with Hamas to get them deported from the U.S., the place where they were apparently headed to experience superior American freedoms, including free speech. Ben Shapiro said that virtually no one should be canceled for speaking about politics in an unapproved way, unless you were a proponent of canceling people over bad takes, in which case you can burn in the bed that you made for yourself. Now, Ben has begun making his own bed and called for the cancellation of anyone who has said anything that overlaps with what Hamas says. Like, for example, the Palestinian people are oppressed. You know, Mehdi Hassan once quoted an academic, Michael Austin, in his book. He said that if Adolf Hitler said the world was round, that wouldn't make it flat. Now, Hamas is responsible for a brutal terrorist attack, but that doesn't mean that there aren't any objective truths mixed in with their messaging. Speaking of Mehdi Hassan, you'd think, with all of his American bootlicking he did for MSNBC, he would have been spared when they came for the Muslims. But amidst the crisis in Palestine, he and two other Muslim anchors were suspended in what appears to be an attempt to protect their narratives. Regarding American bootlicking, Muslim Uyghur groups coming out to show solidarity with Israel with limited or no empathy at all towards the Palestinian situation might not seem logical. But when you find their groups connected to and or funded by the American government, it suddenly makes sense. The World Uyghur Congress is a U.S. funded organization, and they were also very quick to strongly condemn Hamas 
directly for their attack. But they had nothing specific to say about what their fellow Muslims are going through in Palestine, opting to use more ambiguous language. Now, some of these characters wanted to show support with the Palestinians or even Hamas directly in some cases, like with Arslan Hediat. But after his friends scolded him for his expression of support and even threatened to call the FBI on him, as we saw earlier, he swiftly retracted his position, apologized and got back in line. Now, to be fair, though, American influence aside, many overseas Uyghurs look at Israel's apartheid system and ethno-religious state as a model for what they'd like to achieve in Xinjiang. Even Arslan himself actually said that he wanted to see Xinjiang cleansed of all non-Turkic ethnic minorities, and um, other Uyghurs have pra uh, praised Israel's Zionist philosophies. There are overseas Uyghurs who, of course, don't share these ideas, but usually they keep quiet because we've seen before how Uyghurs who tried setting the record straight on the Uyghur genocide narrative, for example, were doxxed and chased off of social media. This is the true face of freedom in the West, and it applies not only to Uyghurs. For the most part, celebrities and other public figures need to show their support for Israel. And when these figures, in far more rare numbers, want to support ordinary Palestinians, they're expected to remain measured, and they're almost always required to attach a condemnation of Hamas to any expression of empathy toward Palestinians. It's a requirement that does not exist in the other direction. But for the most part, the safest bet is to still offer generous expressions of support to only Israel. You know, Justin Bieber posted an image of destroyed buildings with the words, praying for Israel written over top. When he realized it was an image of Gaza, he deleted it. Jamie Lee Curtis posted an image in support of Israel showing children looking up at the sky in fear and captioned it, terror from the skies. When she realized it was Palestinian children, she deleted it. When these people realized the horror that they had been seeing in these images was in fact being experienced by Palestinians, their reaction was not to reconcile and address it. Instead, it was to delete and ignore it. No matter what side you stand on in regard to the current conflict, there is absolutely no way to deny the epic scale of hypocrisy and cognitive dissonance we're seeing. Now, in regards to this narrative, though, more people do seem to see through the BS this time around, though. Um, there's uh, somebody named uh, Caitlin Johnson who has a really good theory on this. I'll share a link to it. But it's getting more and more difficult for government celebrities and platforms to herd people into U.S. State Department approved narratives in general. But they're certainly trying. You know, even YouTube has begun censoring and demonetizing voices like Richard Medhurst, who empathize with Palestinians. Mainstream media are suspending voices that don't play along. And Israel has been literally killing journalists, restricting their access or completely shutting down their operations altogether. Let this all be a lesson for us. Like with the earlier example from Michael Austin about Hitler believing the world was round, you don't need to default to believing the opposite of whatever it is the US government and their mainstream media is saying. But at bare minimum, begin from a place of skepticism, especially for more obscure issues. And especially once they eventually resume, resume pretending to care about persecuted Muslims once again, which of course they will. They'll migrate from wanting you to limit your empathy for a people whose destruction is being televised live back to wanting you to cry for different sets of people whose supposed persecution is supported by convoluted reports and contradicting stories backed by millions of dollars in U.S. government funding. The next time you find Western governments and media desperate to convince you to care about the supposed suffering of people in one place, or attempting to downplay the empathy deserved by another set of people facing undeniable suffering elsewhere. You should have had enough experience by now to know that these contradictions mean they are not guided by any sort of moral code and often isn't even grounded in reality, as we've learned many times before. Instead, it's entirely self-interest driven with a purpose to cater towards their own geopolitical goals. But that's an entire separate topic and video on its home. I'm going to leave it here and I'm going to say everybody take care, stay alert, and may our thoughts and prayers and hopes be with the many innocent people, particularly children, who were born into this current conflict regardless of their side. Peace. Alright, well, Richard, as far as I'm concerned, doesn't get much clearer than that. You have mm. you have probably, more than anybody in Australia, dealt with the, Shin, the Xinjiang claims over... <laughs> 
five years or so now, mm. right? You've repeatedly debunked them in the Australian Alert Service. You'd re- you obviously recognise the truth in what um, Daniel's saying. Yeah, and it's Russia and Ukraine. So the thing that was particularly striking, given that these are current events, that yeah. are, you know the 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 war in Ukraine versus this war in uh, Gaza, Palestine, Israel, where everything that the Russians claimed, you know, in terms of, and they've, contrary to what you've heard, they minimise civilian casualties as best they can because, yep. you know, that's what, you know, that's how they operate. Uh, but there is always a certain amount of dual-use infrastructure hit. There's always a certain amount of collateral damage. This is what happens in wars. All wars everywhere ever. And there were also 14,000 uh, civilians killed before it started yeah. by the Ukrainians. By the Ukrainians. Side, which is why it started. Why it started, yeah. But... The legal justifications that the Russians put up that are in international law, the laws of war, the Geneva Conventions, the, the uh, various other conventions going back to even before the UN existed. And everyone just, oh, they're rubbish. You know, if you, if you mention that, you're a Russian propagandist, yeah. you're a Putin stooge. And now when Israel uses those same legal justifications as a fig leaf for a blatant carpet carpet bombing campaign of whole swathes of Gaza, mm. suddenly that can't be challenged. Yep. That's what really jumped out at me, if you want a live example of hypocrisy in the world today. And because we're definitely running out of time, I want to end on this one observation, because I'm not sure, unless you're delving into this issue through social media, you're certainly not getting this from the mainstream media at the moment. I stand with the Israelis on this issue. And I've, used, I've chosen those words very carefully, Richard. I stand with the Israelis because opinion polls are showing right now 80% of the Israeli public is not saying this was unprovoked, like our politicians are saying. They're not saying that. They are infuriated and they are blaming one person for what's happening there now. And it's not Hamas, Liz leader. It's the Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu. That's who the Israelis are blaming because this is the tough guy of the Middle East. In 2018... Benjamin Netanyahu said, the weak crumble, are slaughtered and are erased from history while the strong, for good or for ill, survive. The strong are respected and alliances are made with the strong and in the end, peace is made with the strong. Now that guy has been the most anti-peace leader of the Mm. Palestinians, of of the the Israelis of all. Um, He took advantage of when they assassinated Yitzhak Rabin um, and he has push this policy that has um, created the circumstance where this event happened and the Israeli people rightfully blame him for it. And you're not getting that through the mainstream media in Australia. You're just getting this where stand with Israel and and Netanyahu Mm -hmm. can do and say no wrong. Um, And no, there is a much more, um, you know, differentiated reality there if you want to pay attention to it. But one thing, just that's why we played this Daniel Dumbrell video, you know, just understand, just from that reference point alone, that proves how much of what we're getting out of this is deliberately crafted propaganda. Anyway, on that note, I know we could um, talk about this for hours more, but we won't. We do have a time limit on this show. Richard, thank you very much for joining us and for writing that article this week, um, getting into that important history. Thanks to the viewers for uh, tuning in. Remember to tune in next more for, this, for the Citizens Report. Look at those links below for making sign those petitions and making those submissions, etc. Thanks very much. Authorised by Robert Bowick, Citizens Party, Melbourne.